here. And our fourth is the 28th of the 6th, 2018. Uh, myself and Trey uh, agreed recently that we would carry out a podcast in relation to um, a form of mental ill health that, that we both believe isn't really recognised sufficiently at grassroots level. There's a lot of talk about uh, the royal family and about the loss of mothers and people going to war, things like that, but there's very little out there about everyday trauma. And we talked about childhood trauma that affected the developmental stages and how it, it formed the adult, how they were. We mentioned about with be, becoming withdrawn because of the trauma or becoming very aggressive or, or quite extrovert uh, or you do things in excess, become very agitated. So what we'd like to, to do is, is try and raise a little bit of awareness about how it feels to have experienced a trauma. And we are talking about having different levels of trauma because we talked earlier there about the fact that trauma can affect you in, in, in a personal way which can be equally as bad as somebody else's. So we're not going to have very severe trauma, very minor trauma or medium trauma. It's trauma nevertheless, it affects your life. So I'm going to bring Train, who uh, I believe has, has struggled more extensively than, than, than I feel I have. Although again, I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's on a particular scale. I think that it's something, and we have worked together about this. I became a therapist for a wee while, and she got worse. Um, <laughs> so we're looking at you as a child, what you experience, the things that you cannot do because you have no control over what comes at you, um, and then we're going to bring it into adulthood and how it affects you when you, when you actually get into adulthood. So I'm going to start with Trey. We're going to talk a little bit about her trauma. We're not going to mention names or, or, or context or whatever. This is just about how it feels to experience it. Okay, Trey? Yeah. Um, I suppose I've touched on a little bit of um, what the traumatic things were. Uh, home environment wasn't good and there was um, violence and addiction problems in the family. And uh, I experienced um, physical and verbal and emotional uh, violence and uh, abuse and that went on for many years. How old were you when you first died? Oh goodness it was going on when I was a toddler and, I, and uh, my first memories of being extremely frightened was when I started having my uh, night terrors I called them as a child. It's flashback dreams now but they were very, very bad, and uh, I'd be about six year old, and I was I would wake up and I was still in the terror, and I used to try and get out of my bedroom to get away from them, um, and um, in the end I got locked in the bedroom so I didn't run out of the house. Uh, that went on for quite a while. Uh, I remember those. I, but I also remember. I'm aware there's great chunks of things I can't remember. Um, Why do you think that is? I think they're just too bad. I think um, because I was very young and I was an only child in this environment, um, it was pretty scary. And I think to survive, my brain has created what I call it a, a, a wall and it goes behind the wall. And what happened when I was younger, a lot of things went behind the wall. And um, some things I think were so bad, I I just forgot them. Um, and I forgot them for a lot of years. And eventually in my late teens, I started to come through some of it. Um, and I realised I was in a few problems. <laughs> Um, and it's strange to have memories and flashbacks of things you don't remember actually happening at the time. It gets very confused and that kind of side of it. Um, and I didn't know what was going on when I was in my uh, late teens and early So why 20s. do you think that you forgot? Was I must it selective? 
I think I was terrified. I think I, I can honestly say my childhood was a very scary place um, and I remember being frightened for most of it. Um, I right up into my mid-twenties, I remember my family died and um, and it was, yeah, it was scary, I was absolutely terrified most of the time. I remember hiding places and stuff like that, uh, when worse of the violence and stuff was going on. So yes, I was scared. Scared out of my head. You know, it's... Um, was, there, was there any embarrassment involved? Yes. And especially because the extended family, everybody, we didn't talk about it. And that was... A uh, very strict rule. Nobody talked about it. It was something that happened behind closed doors, and even though the extended family also knew what was going on, nobody spoke of it, and you never speak of it either. So that was something I was always frightened of. Not just embarrassed, but f the fear of letting something out and somebody knowing. Um, a teacher uh, at school found out something, noticed bruises and questioned me and, and, and I, I, I had had a bad night, it had there'd been a bad night and I, I let some things out and social services visited my home and were sent packing and I got a beaten for that and it, it, it kind of, you, cl you keep things close because you don't dare show anything. Um, I used to very rarely wear skirts and stuff and I always wore long skirts and covered myself up and I still do that a lot to this day, it stayed with me that. Uh, and that's because of hiding things. If I was upset I'll go try and put my head down and I was very, very quiet and withdrawn. I didn't talk about anything. So was that just for the actual um, physical bruising or just the fact that by covering yourself up that made you feel kind of safe? Yes. Yes, it was. It was. It was almost like you put a shield around. That's the only way I can explain it. I needed to shield myself from the world, and also um, I had a my hearing difficulty. I have was even worse then, and I had less hearing. So it was almost like I was in this bubble. I couldn't communicate very well anyway, and I didn't want to communicate, uh, and I couldn't communicate about what was really bothering me, and what was really going on. It was like this big secret. Um, do, do you think, I mean, because we mentioned earlier about childhood, and childhood is a, is a massively crucial time for anybody because it forms the person you're going to be uh, when you grow up, Yeah. when you become an adult, and how you see the world and how the world is, is accessed by you. So if I was to say to you um, that when you've experienced trauma, whatever level, and quite clearly yours is quite a high level, um, do you think it shapes the adult that you become? And if so, in what way? I do believe it does shape, very much so. The adult, uh, I, I can imagine, I can't, well actually I can't imagine what it's like to grow up normal, <laughs> because when I... So what's normal? Yeah, I, I mean to me, I used to look around at people as a, you know, at work, and they seemed quite relaxed and comfortable with themselves and they could laugh easily and uh, they could make friends easily and they were just at ease. I didn't feel like that. I um, I had communication problems, uh, connection problems, and I found it difficult to laugh and get on board with certain humour. Also, um, people being in your physical space, I had real problems with that. Um, I couldn't have anybody standing too close to me. This causes all kinds of problems when you're an adult, because you can't really make connections with people. How do you make connections when you can't have anybody in your space or even have a hug? You're not comfortable with it. So it very much um, affects how you develop as an, you know, as you're growing up and as an adult. You, 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 it's, everything's so difficult. 
So, I mean, obviously a lot of trauma that's talked about is trauma when people are, are adults and something happens, you know, whether it be a loss of a, a family member or whatever. Um, do you think that because childhood is, um, is a time when you develop as a person that more input should be given? Because I know there's a lot of cases come to uh, um, to court about children who should have been taken away from abusive environments mm. and never were. Uh, I mean, I'm going to make a you know um, a judgment on how the children's services are now. But do you think that if if more proactivity took place with what quite clearly, and when I say clearly, it's it's you know implicitly if you work within a particular social care environment, you know if someone's not right. And you'll, you'll, you will become proactive and try to find out, right, what's going on here? Is there some, you know, something going on that's affecting the child to make the child that way? Do you think the services that were more proactive, there'd probably be a lot less trauma for people who grew up into adults? Yes, uh, I think, uh, I do believe that, but I also believe, and it was something that didn't happen for me in my teens, early teens, that help earlier, if if a child has, has gone through difficulties like myself or whatever difficulties have gone through and they have trauma, they need help to work through that. They need help to um, cope with that so they can develop into a, a more uh, at ease adult. Um, even eventually I did move out of the, that environment, the social services came back into it when I was uh, mid-teens. I still got no help. I still was left dealing with this stuff. I still couldn't talk to anybody. <laughs> I had all these things, emotions coming up, but I was still withdrawn uh, and it was I still couldn't cope properly with life. There was no help there at all. So that's crucial. Do you think that early intervention, well, I think we both agree that early intervention is, is, is the way forward. You know, you could blame lack of resources for that, that non-proactivity, but I don't buy that at all. If you're in the business of making sure that uh, children are safe in the right environment, then you, 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 you have to have that early intervention. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, because you're going to sound political on the uh, mm -hmm. podcast. Do you think, really think, that trauma, whether it be with a child or an adult, is really recognised as an illness? No. Um, I mean, I didn't get any kind of uh, recognition until I was in my mid-40s. And even then, it was kind of, yeah, yeah, okay. And um, no, I don't. I think, it, I think it's has been very focused on soldiers and I totally understand that I've been in a war zone and I get that but the trauma that people uh, suffer from from childhood or who are soldiers from life events it's almost like you just have to get on with it oh well happened back then what's your problem uh, wait a minute now <laughs> I'm living a nightmare what do you mean what's your problem yeah I was going to mention that because um, it's very stoic that and that that, that pretty much is the kind of Victorian way about the stiff upper lip and get on with it or whatever, you know, we we haven't got depression, we've got melancholia. You know, when you look at depression, anxiety, uh, mental ill health in general, you know, people have been sectioned, people have been put into institutions for years and years and years. Even in 2018, mental ill health is still not recognised as an illness. You still have people that think you've just got to get on with it. What's up with you? Yeah. You know? Now, all the press about Mental Health Week, Mental Health Awareness Week, and all the rest of it. In the current day now, in 2018, we are still no further on from what we were going back in the 50s. We may, we may well have got rid of the institutions, yeah? But all we've done is created little institutions. And maybe you've got a small percentage of people who are kind of lucky enough to, to get in the right environment and are quite happy and are getting through life. The vast majority of us being turned into smaller institutions. 
Now, depression and anxiety occurs within those groups, and it's not dealt with. Now, we dealt with that on a, on a separate podcast. Yes, yeah. Now, <laughs> you cannot leave someone in, in a state of depression, anxiety, you know, signs of trauma or whatever, because you wouldn't leave someone with a broken leg. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You know, and, and you know, with the greatest respect, I mean, I'm no doubt I'm going to get some flack from people. I, I don't care. We, we do need to, if we're going to get on top of trauma, and then the little threads that come from that, like depression, anxiety, whatever, we really have to recognise this as an illness. Now, you talked there about as a child. Now, can you imagine the child going to school every day that's suffering that trauma? I don't have to imagine it. <laughs> I remember it. Yeah, now, people listening now, I mean, I've experienced it, you've experienced it as well. It's a very lonely place. Uh, you know, you don't have, or we didn't have anywhere, school counsellors where they would, you know, recognise the child very well and take them off to the side. Well, you know, this kid isn't really going to progress very well because of what's going on. We need to rectify that. You know, and this is where all the services should link together. You know, right, what's going on? We need to look into this because this child really can't uh, connect with what's going on properly. So that that child can then learn fully you know, in, in the right way, but feel okay as well. You know, get rid of the embarrassment, the isolation, all the things that go with, with trauma. Things that are just the same, that felt just the same when you're an adult as well. You know, yes. you're gonna feel the same way, you're gonna be isolated people, or for God's sake, you know, pull yourself together. It doesn't work that way. Unless everybody starts to work together, we're still gonna have this problem when we get into 2020 and, and, and beyond. You can have as many mental health awareness weeks as you want. You can have as many, you know, royal family members coming out with what they really endure with, with, with PTSD. Sorry, you know, uh, this happens on the, the, the at grassroots level. There's children now, we're talking now, that have gone to school today who won't be able to cope. So we are, we are doing this, and we're going to come back to it. We're doing this just to highlight exactly how complex trauma is. And also to say to people, right, if you're feeling this way because of what happened in the past, then you need to actually get in touch with, with people and talk to them. And I don't mean in the way where, you know, because I've talked, I feel much better. This is a journey you have to go on. This is a journey you have to go on and, and, and really kind of look at what you've endured and look at how maybe help other people uh, to 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 carry on. So we are going to come back to this. I'm going to just for a few moments with Trey before we we round off. Uh, we're going to take her now into uh, school with the trauma. Yeah. Because we mentioned earlier about childhood trauma and many kids are suffering in silence and that that's the worry for me. So you're ten years of age and you're at school. Yeah. And these mad things are going on at home. How do you cope? Oh, I'm at school. Well, one of the things I used to do, for, if it had been a bad night, and quite often things would happen at night, or over a weekend there would be days of it, and I was back in school. Um, I would go, where I, the school I had it doesn't exist anymore. They used to have a big playing field, and I used to go to the playing field and find a corner and cry because that was the only thing I could do. I couldn't cry in the environment because I used to, that used to get me in trouble. So I used to go on my own and uh, find a corner just to hide it, just so nobody would see um, and let something out. Uh, that was one of the things I used to do and I used to walk I, I, I didn't spend much time with people at lunchtime. I used to just wander around the school grounds um, and just to try and to clear my head or just do something, just move. Did you know how to clear your head? No. I, I used to do a lot of walking when I was younger on my own, just to get out of the environment. I used to walk miles and um, it was just the moving. It was almost like you were running away and that's what it felt like. I'm trying to get away from what's going on but I'm carrying it with us and I'm still trying to get away from me. And so I was walking, walking, I used to walk miles and miles and sometimes not go on for hours. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and being in class was a nightmare. 
I mean, not only did, could I not hear the teacher properly, so I was stuck right in the front of the class, which sticks you out there anyway. Um, for uh, trying to concentrate when you're so tired and you feel frightened and you know you've got to go back to it and it just gets in the way. You don't know where you're going back to. And I'm trying to take a lesson in maths, which I was crap at, and anything else. Um, I, I kind of like the sciences, that helped a wee bit. I, I, I got, I could focus on that a bit better. But most of me uh, studying was just awful. So, I mean, we're going to come back in a later podcast with, with this about coping strategies, about what you can do uh, to help you. I mean, obviously you'd have to access particular services first to try to get, get help if you can. But but on a personal level, there are things you can do to, to help you to cope. And Trey mentioned one there about walking and things. But when you're, when you're a child, obviously if you're walking miles and miles and miles, you might not get back from miles and miles and miles. You might end up... Uh, getting picked up so we're not actually advocating children walking miles and miles and miles but that's a quite clear sign of trying to get away from it, what it is that's disturbing you. Yeah. Now in school uh, and again I'm not saying that teachers you know because I know they're very busy and there's you know there's more and more work to do but schools have a responsibility to try to recognise if children aren't coping. And I don't mean just with, with the learning just emotionally are they coping, are they very withdrawn, are they very introverted, is, is, is there perhaps that, that kind of blank thousand mile stare, you know, they're not necessarily connecting with the, the class and it's not a sensory problem like say hearing or, or, yeah. or eyesight. The schools I think also have a responsibility to, to possibly the early intervention we talked about, recognise a child that might be suffering abuse, that might be suffering the trauma because of the abuse and then maybe the early intervention could possibly protect that child from further abuse or further impact on the, the trauma itself, which, which could then probably help them when they get into adulthood because they've had some intervention. Now, I know there's not a lot out there, but the schools, if they recognise a child is, is struggling, quite often, and this is the, the worrying thing for me, they tend to be taken off to a, a special educational section, although we haven't got many of them now either, or they're given what's called a learn support. And it's almost like putting a big flag on the, the back of the chair. Look at me, I'm a numpty, basically. Now, I don't think that helps. I'm not decrying people who work in learn support, but you're just highlighting the actual problem. That happened to me when I was in junior Did school. Yeah, Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, it was partly because of my hearing. Like I said, I wasn't completely deaf, but I had to have um, grommets fitted eventually for a few years. And I had various surgery. But, so that was part of the problem, but the other part was like a double whammy. I had these other problems going on, which I didn't speak about. Um, and I was put in uh, the class uh, in junior school with uh, people who had learner disabilities. And... Um, uh, and uh, challenging behaviour and it was a nightmare basically I used to, I remember sitting in the corner when you have people throwing chairs about and stuff and thinking this is great you know I, I, I go home and I've got things being thrown about and violence and I'm sitting in class and there's things being thrown about and violence and I was absolutely terrified it, it, it was my worst nightmare stuck in that class and I learnt nothing I didn't get out of it till I went to uh, senior school. So do you think then, I mean again, this is an open question and it's quite a wide one as well. Uh, I don't think we can expect uh, teachers to be trained in how to, to identify trauma, depression, anxiety, signs of abuse, whatever. I do think there's a responsibility on schools to have people who can do that. Yeah. And if it means building that into the uh, the teacher training, then I, I would definitely advocate that because that would definitely um, create early intervention. And if you get the early intervention, then the child probably won't continue to endure. So I would say, whoever's listening now as a, as a teacher, uh, I've worked in colleges and, and training development, etc. I was trained to recognise those signs of withdrawal. Um, so I was introvert. 
someone was very very anxious or yeah. they, were, they were they were trying to hurt themselves or whatever it could be because I trained on that side I do think because schools are so big and they're so daunting and so frightening and you know, every child settles in there less so if you go to school after a really bad night mum and dad's been fighting carrying on there's been abuse or whatever not necessarily sexual but physical or just verbal you know, people often don't think about that one because verbal is a really big one. It's attritional yes, it over is. a period of time. Do you think the question's going to be eventually true uh, that I think you touched on it earlier that there should be recognition of children that could potentially be struggling at all? Oh, the, I think it's very important. Um, one of the things that, that I remember a lot of, apart from the fear and stuff, was the loneliness. I felt very alone because you are isolated in this world and there was nobody I could talk to or go to or help me in any way. And that affects every aspect of your life as a child and as you get, get older. So school's not fun. I, I mean, I do not remember school any schooling right up to the left as fun. I hated it. There's 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 kids, you know, children playing can be a struggle was a struggle for me. Loud voices, if anybody kicked off, if there's any kind of um problem in class. I, w I was like a nervous wreck. I was just sitting there freezing all the time thinking, Oh please don't let that come in my direction. Um just getting to and from school because some of the children um at school sometimes you'd maybe bullies I got bullied some of the shocking at school right the way through because I was different I was quiet the uh, bullies kind of often go for the uh, the quiet ones so yes it, it, it's really important I think to have training for teachers to see there could be problems to be able to um, get to know children that think there could be problems to talk to them to to make them feel comfortable and safe, to be able to speak and know that there isn't going to be some kind of comeback on them. You know, even if it's, they can't do anything for that child other than give them an ear, somebody to talk to. You know, the, if, the, if the child is sick, you can't tell anybody because I'll get in so much trouble. But they can go to that person when they've had a, a really awful time and say, I'm, I'm struggling, can, can I just sit and talk to you? And give them that. You know, that in itself is something. Because I remember what it was like to have nothing. Yeah, I do as well. And, and if it's that one teacher uh, that could potentially make you a better adult. Yes. And have you have a better life. Just in that, in that one instance, if, if you can show that care and compassion towards that child, and if you can't deal with it, but you can give them that time and listen to them as well, and then refer it on to someone that can help, that can look into it and you know spend that time with you. And I know, again, we talk about resources, and, and there isn't a great deal in those areas, you know, social care and education, sadly. And, and if there's any Tories listening, uh, please take note. Um, <laughs> you know, we can give the Irish government 1.5 billion, but we can't fund our schools and social care sufficiently well to to try to ease these problems that we're talking about now. Yeah. Uh, and it does need to be recognised because everything is all meshed, it's all tied in together. You know, if you send a child to, to school, then that child has to be happy in school. There's responsibility on the teachers to, to create an environment where the children can learn. There's also a, a responsibility and obligation to recognise and be trained to recognise children who can't access that learning for whatever reason. Yeah. So I think that that's that's a massive that. Uh, and I know we talk about trauma, but all these things like refers etc. They're all tied in with 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 the trauma and how we can, you know, ease that and maybe get in early so it won't be quite so bad when the child grows up. You know, cause that's well, yeah, because if you have no help as a child, you've got no chance as an adult. I mean, you have to find a way yourself to find coping uh, strategies to help yourself, um, ways to deal with the things that you trauma, because it doesn't go away. It follows you, and in some ways, um, I my worst times was in my 20s, I felt, because it's almost like somebody caught up with us. You know, that wall alone, it lasts for so long. And unfortunately, you find out just how much is behind that wall, and you have to deal with it. Not fun at all. 
Um, and that can break a person. It really can break a person. You put you on your knees and some people never come back from that. No, that's true. Do you think that when, when you go to work as well, because I mean, again we are talking about institutions here, you know, the school's an institution, yeah. everybody does as they're told and, and dresses the same way or whatever, and then you go to work and it's just uh, no, so you do as you're told, you wear a tie, you don't wear short skirts, you wear this, you don't wear high heels, etc. Or in some cases bosses actually tell you to wear high heels, which is quite a, um, a weird case I think last year sometime. There's been probably many more people do that. Uh, the actual um, uh, institutions that we we talk about, um, like work, do you think that work itself creates another layer and another barrier for the trauma? Do you think that a lot of bosses, a lot of companies actually recognise that as, a, as an illness? Do you think they can actually recognise it uh, you know, with their employees? Is it, is it recognised in the workplace as an actual illness? Or is it another situation where you've got to pull yourself together and get on with it? Do people with the trauma just do that anyway and get on with it? Does it affect the way they interact with their employ fellow employees? Um, I don't think it's recognised. Um, I, I mean, the person, who, you know, the family member caused most of my problems uh, for me died in my mid-twenties not of natural causes, was a traumatic death. And I, well, I had only been in a job a few months and I could barely speak for three months because of that event. And nobody knew around me what to do. I could do me, I was doing my job, but it was the, the, the interactions. I was very much, it was just my job. I couldn't have a, you know, a general conversation with anybody. And it took me months. I had to come out of that and somebody said to me one day, you're getting better. And I just looked at them, I had no idea where I'd been. I didn't even know what they were talking about. They'd noticed something was wrong, they knew, because obviously at the time there was, you know, there was a car case and stuff, so they knew what had happened. Um, but they did, didn't recognise what I was going through. They, they, they didn't, or they didn't know what I was, you know, what to do. And that's what was said. We didn't know... Um, when I was able to communicate a bit better, they said, well, we didn't know what to say to you because you, you weren't speaking. And that's that's what they said, that's what, what I got. And I didn't feel um, resentment towards them about that. But it would have been really good, to, I think, for companies to recognise that trauma um, is, affects people, their employees. And if something happens, like another thing happened for me that makes that even worse. What there's something that can do to help, because it's going to affect how you work. I was trying to work with customers, really, on a daily basis, as well as um, in my work colleagues, and I didn't even know. I don't even know how I got through that three months after you know the, the court case. I, I kind of like it was a blur. I, I can't remember things. I've learned new things. I had no idea I was doing it. So do you think that, that um, I mean, I, I actually think that, that it should be recognised in the workplace. Uh, and I mean proper um, depression, anxiety, uh, trauma, although those, those are all linked together. Um, I, I don't mean the ones where people just oh, feel a bit down to do. What about night out last night? You know, I mean real proper uh, anxiety, depression that affects your work so the employer can then support you yeah. in a way that, that that's valid and not just just ticking a box you know because it's it's probably going to be better for someone to function fully with that trauma depression anxiety whatever uh, if they get the support from their employer because I think a lot more people can stay in work with trauma with depression with anxiety uh, with the right input from the employer you know, it might be a short period of time where they go off for a wee while to get their head together, but then ease back into to the workplace. I know they have occupational health and all the rest of it, but not every employer, and I think statistically it's been proven that, that there's quite a high percentage of employers that don't recognise those things as, as illnesses. It's almost like, well, we're going to get on with the job, come on, you know, somebody else will do the job. 
you wouldn't do that with someone who just had cancer or they'd broken their leg or they had some, you know, no, some you, illness. You wouldn't. And I think as well, uh, one of my experiences, um, because obviously there's, there's lots of things, even even in me, adult things have happened, um, and you, it's almost like you're just expected to keep going. Um, you get comments like, "Well, you've had a bad week, haven't we?" Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you're trying to keep going. You're trying to do your job, and it's almost like if you don't do it to a certain standard, then what's your problem? Why aren't you doing it? There's no real understanding. There's no sitting down saying, "Right, okay, what's wrong? How can we help?" I've never had that in all the jobs I've had. Never had that situation, and I've been through some awful stuff while I was in, you know, working. And the employees were aware of that. Well, I, I was probably lucky in that respect because, well, not lucky, because um, there's quite a number of places where it didn't occur. But I know in 2006, which which is is quite well documented between you and I, um, I uh, had to go off work because of uh, stress and anxiety, and you know the workload was 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 kind of excessive, and I was taking too much on, and you know I wasn't really getting the balance right. But I remember um, my boss at that time, who you've met, Carol, Carol yes. Pugh. Yeah. Uh, we need more bosses like you, Carol, if you're listening. Um, she did deal with that situation in a way where I could ease myself back into work. Now, it was, it was just the way she was. Yes. And I think, you know, if you've got no stigma about, you know, people who are like that and all the rest of it, and you just... You know, you know the employee well. You know that, that that this is not really them. You know they're obviously not well. Then you treat that as an illness, and you deal with them in a way where you know you would deal with someone who was unwell clinically with with a broken leg or whatever. Yeah, and she did that, and I don't think that if she if she'd done that, sorry, if she hadn't done it, I don't think I'd have gone back to work. Yeah. Because at that time I was having quite bad panic attacks, you know, we've talked about it before. I felt quite detached and disconnected and again that ties in with, with trauma. Um, and, you know, with that input, I was able to get back into to everyday life again. Because that's the other thing about trauma. It, it, it literally disconnects you from everyday life. It does. And you just get on with everyday life, but you're not actually connected to you it. You know, and and also, I mean, I was unfortunate enough to develop um, a chronic illness, um, which is probably being brought on by the trauma. Um, you know, because it, it is recognised that uh, bowel disease could be caused by uh, continuous stress and anxiety, and that basically was um, a breaking point for me, cause, because because suddenly not only did I have my trauma to deal with but I also had a chronic illness that could uh, develop into cancer and that was that really did mess with me it, it, it was the the thing that that knocked me out of work eventually I mean I, I lasted a few more years but it, it was just too much I, I couldn't do any more I couldn't cope anymore um, I didn't have any more strength in us it, 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 it was really hard and I felt like I'd, I was weak and I'd, I failed um, and I remember um, dealing with my doctor uh, over the, uh, the ulcerative colitis I have and it was I had a flare up, I had to go on medication, I was really upset and he said why are we always dealing with this as if it's a war zone? As if it's a, I said because it is, it's a battle and I'm not winning and that's how I saw it and that's how I've always saw my trauma I'm weak and I'm not strong enough to beat it because I didn't know anything else. N nobody um, showed me how it really was. It was my fault and I wasn't beating it and I was weak. And and the, when I got ill, physically ill as well, it was a double one me. I couldn't even beat that. I'm not going to do this. I've got nothing left. So yeah, I used to get very, very upset about that. Do you think that now, um, fast tracking to the current day, that, that you've become stronger mentally and physically? Yes, I have. I've found a purpose again. Um, working for me was a way to cope. Um, it gave me 
some kind of purpose to give me a focus. It made me feel like I was more than what was going on. I was feeling it was uh, I could achieve something, and I took pride in that. When I had to give up, give up work, it was just devastating. Uh, I, I've got no other words for it. Um, so when um, you know you, you asked me to get involved with uh, SS2, and I got more involved, it gave me some purpose back. It gave me um, a sense of um, belonging. And it allowed me to step away a little bit from the pain I was in because I was living in it. I was nothing else. And um, I found ways to be able to uh, be more focused and and step away more from that pain um, through various things, through the charity and, and me, you know, work out and keep fit and exercise and, you know, well-being and that and helping others. That's really been great for me um, to see other people suffering the way I've suffered and trying to help them. That's that's really good. That's that's really helped me uh, as well because I w I don't want anybody else to suffer the way that way. I don't want anybody else to feel that isolation and that pain and that and that loneliness and that lust. And there's no way to go, and there's no way out of this. Uh, I don't want people to feel that. So, to try and help somebody else. So, because we've talked about trauma, and we're going to round off now because we've, we've got quite a lot on that first part there. This is the usual quest I always ask you. <laughs> that that sounded to me almost like a message to people listening now. Right, if you're struggling with something like that. Some of the things we've mentioned before, whether it be depression, anxiety, the trauma, and they're all tied in together. Um, would you say to people that doing the things you've mentioned, yeah. uh, if people are struggling with that, could potentially help them to, to, to start to move away from, from where they're, they're actually stuck at the moment? Yes. It, it, it would, um, and I'm not saying it's easy. And even, you know, every week there will be something. And I have a flashbacks in session, um, and I've really struggled. It's almost like it, you're trying to do something, and this is happening at the same time, and you're, you're, it's overwhelming. And it's just, it's just finding a way to keep going. I think, right, okay. That's happened. I feel really bad. I've had a bad night or whatever, but I'm going to go in here. I'm going to try. I used. I think I explained it to you. I used to come through the door and say, "Right, that is out of side the room," and I'm going to come into this room, and I'm going to be with these people, and I'm going to try and leave what I'm feeling out there. For for the people who are listening now, that's trade of their own cognitive behavioural therapy. <laughs> Uh, in the absence of the knowledge of cognitive behavioural therapy. So if she sounds smart, it's because she's been smart. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. So, so anybody listening, and I hope people do listen, uh, we'd like you to, to, to give us your comments about what we've talked about. We are going to come back to this because we've all just, just you know, touched uh, a wee part of it. Um, please try some of the things that, that, that Trey's mentioned. Uh, begin the journey because it is a journey uh, and it's worth it well, I think you mentioned before Trey it's painful yes it is it is painful it probably will always be painful to a certain extent but you can learn to deal with the uh, the pain in a, in a much more positive way uh, and you know it will dissipate in some some ways it won't go away because you know with trauma it tends to hang around God love it likes to live you know in that place but you can learn to control, you know, whether or not you open the door and allow those feelings to revisit you again. And anybody who listening and is not quite sure about flashbacks, the term flashback, it is pretty much what it says. You, you, you're flashing back to a time that wasn't very nice. It's coming into the present. Yes, yeah. It's quite vivid as well. Yeah. So, if you, again, if you're experiencing something like that, then, you know, please give us your comments and try to, to take some knowledge that we've kind of... Uh, giving you on this podcast but we are going to come back um, 
So I'm going to thank Trey for the honesty, and you can comment on our blog page. Yes, Facebook uh, page. Our Facebook page, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I don't mean we're going to start one of those forums where people are up all night twined about something <laughs> for the next 3,000 years. We're talking about proactivity, where we actually learn to move away from from that trauma. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Any final comments before we round off? Um, I think this is going to be an interesting journey for the both of us, uh, because uh, trauma is a very secretive and personal thing and the biggest problem is talking about it so i think this is as as scary as it can be uh talking about it openly is has got to be a good thing yeah it's a good thing but as i said earlier on in the podcast which you probably heard talking and talking and talking and talking without doing anything is is pointless the talking will begin the journey then you have to do things yes, to move do. away from that. And unfortunately, at the moment, all we're getting is the message from the royal family is, it's good to talk. If you talk about, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's going to get it out there. Yeah, but when you get it out there, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. Because actually what you're doing is, Prince Harry, is overloading the already stretched mental health services. Because all these people are coming forward now, what are you going to do for us? Well, yes, and I think... Um Myself, like yourself, I'm being, I've always been proactive. I've always wanted to try and find a way to um, get away from my trauma and deal with it and just have some peace in life and be happy. So I've always looked for things, always trying to find ways to do that. So it's, yes, talking about it and exploring it, but then what you, being positive and say, right, I'm going to deal with this now. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to we're going to mention some things that we've used and other people that we advocate to, or prescribe to, um, uh, on the next podcast. Yes. Yep. So that's a wrap. Thank you very much, folks, and we'll see you next time.